Start the stream. Starting stream. Lauren, you are live. You are live. A very good morning to you all. This is Lauren down here, and I do have a surprise for you. We are at a new dive site. Welcome to Eagle Ray Rock. So this is completely new for all of us. So I have my amazing cameraman Emil behind the camera, and of course Patrick somewhere on the surface. Now I am currently at 20 meters, so that is actually quite deep. And Eagle Way Rock is basically a pinnacle of rock that's incredibly beautiful, but completely unexplored. So I am as new to it as all of you watching at home. So of course, it gets the name Eagle Ray Rock because in the sandy areas, there can be a lot of Eagle Rays. So what we're gonna do is just go over the pinnacle and circle it to see what we can find. But every so often, I'm going to look into the blue for turtles and eagle rays. When we were on the surface, we saw a lot of turtles coming up for air, so you never know. So Pat, over to you and let's go explore. Welcome everybody. I hope you are as excited as Lauren and I are. So we are actually diving off a boat today, which has opened up all of these new dive sites. And it looks like we are starting off this dive with a trumpet fish. Yes, we are. Emil found that trumpet fish. I could hardly see it because it is so camouflaged. Now, this is a very small juvenile trumpet fish. They do get much bigger than this. And it has a slightly pale, pinky complexion because it's really doing its best to hide inside that gorgoni in there. It really doesn't want to be seen. Now, these are really stealthy predators. They are designed in such a way that they're really good at hunting. They, they leave hardly any shadows. They can cruise around the reef almost unnoticed and they can snap up their prey. They can colour change a lot to blend in and obviously because of their body shape they're able to just disguise themselves among gorgonians, sponges and various other corals. Now of course the name trumpetfish comes from that elongated snout. It looks like a trumpet. Yeah, and we can see at the end of that snout, there is a tiny little thing hanging off its chin. Now, this is called a barbell, and it serves as a bit of an extrasensory organism for the animal. And they do hang very still. This is a common thing. You will most likely see a trumpet fish when you do spot them doing this. So they stay very, very still. And obviously being amongst the Gorgonians and being a similar colour, then it does actually camouflage them quite well. Sometimes you'll be looking at a Gorgonian and not even know that there is a little trumpet fish hiding away in there. Exactly. So we'll let this trumpet fish hide out and we are going to explore the pinnacle. I can see a huge barracuda sitting on top of the pinnacle, but we're going to go around it and see what we can find. There's lots of ledges here, so it does look to me the perfect place for turtles to sleep or sleep with air quotes during the night time. So it's so refreshing and exciting to be diving somewhere else. But I also have no idea what to expect. <laughs> That's all right. What are you hoping to see? Well, obviously being at Eagle Ray Rock, I would not mind an Eagle Ray at all. Uh, but maybe a nurse shark. I would really like to see a nurse shark today. Oh, that would be great. It is early in the morning here. It is only 7 a.m. We do have a beautiful and very pale angel fish going towards the meal. Very pale. Almost white. 
but it is a great angel fish. Mm, we can't. Can that, not Emil? just yet. Emil. <laughs> so don't forget, if you do have any questions on the trumpet fish or the angel fish or anything that you're seeing this dive, please send in your questions. And if you're on Twitter, use the hashtag dive live. And what a beautiful grey angel fish this is. Yeah, so that is a key identification feature of the grey angelfish is obviously for starters they are grey and secondly they do have these yellow backsides of their fins, of their pectoral fins. Now a pectoral fin is the fins that sit on either side of the body. And what's quite interesting is between the French and the grey angelfish is their juvenile phase looks very, very similar. It's almost impossible to tell the, ju to tell the two juveniles apart. They both are black and white, sorry, black and yellow striped. They still hold the same shape but are much smaller. Now, as they grow and metamorphosize, they start to look different. The French angelfish will get the yellow tinge to its scales, and the grey angelfish obviously gets this whitey grey kind of tinge to its scales. And this one is very large. I would say about 45 centimetres, right. maybe even 50 centimetres maximum from nose to tail. So that is about 20 inches long. Yeah, that's a big one. And it's very pale and it seems to be looking for some food on the sand, which is maybe why it's so pale to blend in with the colour of the sand. Yeah, well, that's not a bad thought there, Lauren. That is something that a lot of fish tend to do, is lighten their colours. So, especially in the barracudas, if you see a barracuda hunting over sand, it will most likely lighten to a really white colour. And then, once they swim back up into the pelagic zone, they'll go back darker to blend in. Oh, it just, um... Oh. <laughs> it just pooped on the camera. Did you manage to get that? Yes, yes. That's still going. <laughs> So that would be getting rid of quite a bit of sponge matter, I would say. So sponges are one of the favourite foods of this angelfish. Yeah, oh, 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 it's still going. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And it's coming very close to us. This, is, this animal is not shy, but oh. Ah, this is a really, really oh, great sighting. And we can just see how elongated that dorsal fin is, the top fin on its body. It really reaches back past the tail in this one. Usually they're about level with the tail, but this one really goes back. Yeah, they're so graceful and elegant. Sometimes I like to think of myself as an angelfish underwater, but I'm definitely not. They're definitely one of the most beautiful sounds on the reef. And I think now it's going for a feet. So we are going to continue our exploration of this pinnacle. Now we actually have an interesting question here from Richard and he's asking whether different species of angelfish can interbreed and yes they can. So here yeah. in the Caribbean there is, I believe it's, I know one is the queen angelfish and I think it's with either the, the queen French... and the blue angelfish meet together to create a hybrid called the Townsend angelfish. And it, I think we've actually seen it on a live dive once and actually wrongly called it the queen. So it has features of both, but it's the queen and the blue that meet together to create this hybrid called the Townsend. Sorry to uh, burst your bubble, Lauren, but I did actually watch that dive back and that was just a queen angelfish, unfortunately. We oh, didn't you know get what our I'm hybrid. Talking about? Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was not a hybrid, unfortunately. So the current is actually quite strong down here. I think it's the strongest I have felt on a live dive. And Emil has another trumpet. So this yeah. Is an adult form. There's actually two right here. So this is cool. But 
but we're gonna keep going. I just want to show the whole pinnacle to you and just how beautiful it really is. Wow, this is great. So we've got a little four-eyed butterfly fish in between, in behind those two trumpet fish. And they are really blending in with that Gorgonian. We can really see how much the current is also throwing them around. So Lauren's work is really cut out for her today. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to use my ear much quicker than normal. But as long as we can give you a good dive, that is what matters. So we're just going to go up over the pinnacle here. And hopefully you can see how the very small area, so all the moving lights, is very concentrated in one part. And it's just so gorgeous. It is beautiful. And now, how high up would you say this pinnacle reaches? I am at 15 metres and I'm almost at the top next to that barracuda I spotted at the start. And the, when I was on the sandy bottom it was, it was 20. So this pinnacle, this sort of outcrop of coral, I would say is about 5 to, to 6 metres high. Yep, that's great. So that's about 20 feet high. Yeah, and uh, Emil has got us on this barracuda, which is just really blending in with the top of the reef. It's very dark in colour because they can go much lighter and you can see that it's a great barracuda. Yeah, so this is one of the 30-odd species of barracuda called the Great Barracuda. And just like the trumpet fish we saw, they are ambush predators. So something that ambush predators tend to have in common is that they can stay very still. So as we can see with the trumpet fish before and with this barracuda, they're very, very still and cautious animals. So barracuda will quite often hide behind or next to something, staying very, very still. And then when a fish comes past unsuspecting, that's when it'll strike with that thick muscular torpedo body. And this one in front of us right now, I would say is about a meter or so. So three feet, it's definitely a big one. And it's very round as well, it's a full adult. And barracudas are normally quite solitary animals, or at least this species is. And right now, it looks like it's searching for a place to be clean. <laughs> it's definitely getting pushed by this current like me. And we can really see how strong its mouth is as well. It's got very thick, robust jaws. And this is obviously because of their predatory needs. So they also have very big, long, grasping teeth as well. So they really are just built for eating prey and snatching it up. And once they have it there, they're not going to let it go. And if they let, do let it go, it'll be in two different pieces, that's for sure. And it looks like a little bit deeper, so we'll let the barracuda be clean. We'll stay on the top of this beautiful pinnacle. And we see a bar jack hanging around the barracudas. We so often see with bar oh and he didn't like it at all. He said go away. <laughs> yeah, the bar jack is always there, you can never escape them. So just to give you an air check, I am at 120 bar, so definitely use my air a lot quicker than normal, but it's worth it. Yeah, it's been a great dive so far. There's a lot of, I mean, still have similar fish species here, but the abundances and, and the dynamics are a lot different. And obviously this, this site is a lot more top, the, the, the topography is a lot different here than what we get at Casuarina Point. So it's been exciting so far. Yeah, so because it's a really small area, like we mentioned, we call this a pinnacle. It's going up from the sand. Evidence seems to be more densely packed 
So normally when the guys don't catch it in my week, it's quite a long week. And everything's a little bit more spaced out. But here, it just seems to be so much more concentrated with everything together, which makes it an ideal dive site. And there is lots of other chemicals extending from it. So you have the main one, and then you have lots of other ones. So me and Emil are constantly keeping our eyes peeled. Because we never know what's going to swim past. So please do send in your questions or any requests that you may have. Since it is called Eagle Ray Rock, of course I am hoping to see an Eagle Ray. And we do have a question from Take Care asking why do you use more air when you're deeper? Well that's because of the direct relationship between depth and pressure. So as you get deeper in the water the pressure starts to increase and so therefore reduces the volume of air. So the more you breathe the more air you're going to be taking in. So the deeper you go the faster you will go through your air. Oh wow, this is a beautiful sponge. It's really iridescent. It's it's glowing. Wow. Oh, oh my goodness. No, that's not what you're supposed to look at. Look inside the sponge, I believe. There is a really large decorator crab. Oh, that's great. So we can't see it at the moment. We can definitely see the sponge. So a lot of animals actually do make the inside of a sponge their home. It's, it's just like any other crack or, or hideaway on the reef for them essentially. It just provides shelter and also gives them a better opportunity at getting yeah, food. So this big thing that looks like algae inside the sponge is a crab. Now you might not even be able to see it because it is so camouflaged. Have you got a good view of it yet? Yes, that's looking better now. I mean, it still is very hard to distinguish as a crab, but <laughs> oh wow, this is great. So it looks like the body shape of a, of a arrow crab, actually. Um, it is com it's really large. It's like almost the size of the palm of my hand, but it is just completely camouflaged. So it's covered in sort of algae and little bits of things attached to it to completely blend into this pun. I'm really not sure if you're, if you're going to be able to see it like I can, but it's absolutely out this world. No, we do have an awesome look at it now. <laughs> It is just fascinating to see this thing and, and to know that it, it is kind of, it's made this, it's really cool. They're, they're just a walking ecosystem, really. I'm not going to take the credit for that one, but yes, <laughs> that is amazing. So that is another first here on Dive Live. We've been getting a lot of firsts lately, uh, which a has lot. been good. Now this Zoom has opened up so many more worlds for us. We are really starting to explore more. Um, we've obviously got better use of the, the Zoom technology, so so many doors are opening, and every time we dive, there's a new first. So it's great to be able to share that with you. Two chemicals, and I can amass so many animals. I think the mule is going to try and get you a beautiful view of this canyon. Yeah, so this is a great bit of natural topography here. And it does look absolutely stunning. And we do have a question here from Love Dogs asking how far are we from Casuarina Point? Oh, that's a we're out to the left about three miles from Casuarina Point in the south direction. So we are now southwest of the island. So it's quite far and we did go out on the boat but we are still with Don Fosters using their boats. They have treated us to a little treat for the day of exploration. So quite far from the usual dive site. 
Yeah, it's really nice to be to be away a bit. So Lauren did say we're about three miles, which is about five kilometres for all our metric friends. And Amanda is asking us whether we feed the fish. Uh, no, we definitely do not. We want to leave the environment in the most natural state as possible. And feeding the fish can bring on all kinds of trouble that we don't want and we don't really need. We really just want to show you all these fish in their natural habitat, in their natural state, without having any influence on that or minimal influence on that. I'm just adjusting some cable here, Pat. Yeah, no worries. We can see that there's a bit of a different coral growth here. It's more plated and encrusting and we can see that there's a bit of... It looks like there's wires coming out of the rocks here, but that is actually a coral as well. So that is called a wire coral, and they are a... I believe they are an antipatharian or a black coral. Now, we generally only get them on these types of structures, the walls and that, because they actually prefer a darker, deeper environment. So you do find them a lot deeper on the wall, but they are found in shallower areas if it's like this, where it's really uh, outcropped and covered and, and like, like a ledge. Yeah, there's so many ledges here and keep peeking it in them. Oh, there must be some things that need a perfect tidy place to be in amongst these ledges. And one thing it's always just great to keep in mind is that all of this structure is living, you know? I mean, obviously the inside parts aren't, but all, most of the outside that you're looking at are living, breathing animal. Yeah, well, maybe to give, to compliment what Pat is saying, I'm sort of hanging off a, a drop here. Here, we have a huge boulder brain coral. All around it, we have little bits of algae, different species of algae, actually. Then we have sponge. So just to give you an idea of what Pat was trying to say, there's just so many things here living together. And it's not necessarily all in harmony, because they are all directly competing with one another. So you can see there's a sort of end to the coral, and it meets and clashes with the algae. And this is because they are absolutely competing against one another for light, space, food. And it's not just coral and algae and sponges. They are the main competitors, the three main competitors of the reef. Actually, individual coral colonies, even of the same species, will compete with one another. Everybody's in competition. Everybody's fighting for food and space and light. So to us, it looks beautiful and magical, which it is. But to actually be living on this reef, you're in constant competition with everything around you. You have to maintain your area, fight for your space, your food, and your ability to get access to the sunlight. So everything is very close together. Every time I look around, I just see competition, competition. Everyone's fighting. And some species of coral have even been known to be gorgeously the contents of their stomach, which is mainly acid, onto other corals in order to compete and kill them. So it's a crazy world down here. There's a lot more happening than you think. And it is unreal, really. And, and to think of this on a timeline when the corals are fighting, you could think that it's obviously going to be a very slow battle. So we only have really observed it through time-lapse uh, videography. There's no real way to sit there and watch it because it is a slow, slow battle. But that really highlights just the, the three main things that are competed for are mates, resources, and space. So that is pretty much the same on land. It's the same anywhere in life. So 
just to give you an update on my ear, I'm on 90 bar, so that's 90. The current is very strong here, that's what we do for strong current. So I'm literally just hanging here. <laughs> so yeah, we still have time to dive with you, but at the moment I have 90 bar. Uh, so Spass is asking, can some <laughs> could sponges form colonies alongside the corals? What was that? Sorry, Pat. Can sponges form colonies alongside corals? Um, sponges are actually very ancient animals. I think they started to form around 650 million years ago, and they are probably the secondary most dominant animal coral on the coral reef so in terms of sessile animals and they formed before corals so sponges were the first to form on reefs 650 million years ago it's a very long time and it's fascinating also to see that they haven't really changed much either over this 650 million years. So they do live sessile, which means that they attach, they don't move, they don't have muscles, they don't have tissues, they don't have organs. Yet somehow they've still managed to survive 650 million years. They really did uh, lay, lay the foundation for for future evolution, I suppose. They are... They are the, the patient zero, so to speak. And we're seeing a lot of rope sponges as well. So those structures coming off that look like a whip, that is actually a sponge. Now they also do get Gorgonian corals that looks just like them. But we can tell that this one is a sponge because we can see that it's got lots of little holes and they are its exhalant pores which it uses to breathe out essentially but they also they don't just breathe out that's also how they capture their food as well by drawing it in and then blowing it back out yeah, so sorry i was just adjusting the cable there so we are going to swim above another canyon in between these huge coral outcrops so we're just going to slowly swim. It's very wide, it's not narrow, so there's lots of room for us without touching anything. Oh wow, did you see that? What? This... Sorry, the fish all just got chased by a bigger fish and they just all dispersed at the one time. There's so many fish just hanging out in the current. So the currents are a real advantage to fish because they don't have to swim much. They can just hang out there and see the direction that the food is coming. So normally when there is a stronger current present, it's actually great news for a diver. Although you might have to kick and swim a little bit harder, at least you're going to see more light and more food. And sometimes even the bigger animals, what we call the megafauna, will be much more present in stronger currents because the food is being driven in. So this is just amazing. On one side I have a huge coral pinnacle and on the other side I have one. So I'm trying to stay as streamlined and as straight as possible and just drift with the current. And if anybody was wondering who that handsome diver was in the background, that is our, our good friend Sergio. So he's been kind enough to take us out on his day off, out on the boat, and he's down there also spotting for us. So. Oh no, my secret's out. Now you know how I found that crab. <laughs> I was going to try and keep it a secret from you all, so you thought I found that decorator crab, but it was Sergio. And he is the manager of Don Foster's Dive Center, and he's so kind taking us out on the boat to deliver this experience to you. Now, Amanda wants to know how do the plants get their colours? Well, there actually isn't any plants here. 
underwater on this reef. So we have algae, but algae is technically not plants. Now what I think you're referring to is the corals. And it's actually really interesting how corals, so corals are an animal, let me start by classifying that. So they're not actually a plant or algae, they are an animal. And what they hold in their skeletons and their, um, in their tissues, sorry, uh, what's called zooxanthellase, which is a type of algae that produces food from the sunlight. Now, the corals will hold this algae inside of them and harness their energy that they make. And in return, they get shelter and a place to live. Now, these algae come in a whole range of different colour, and this is what gives the corals their coloration. Now, if the environment gets too stressful, like if it gets too hot from global warming, the corals will actually get rid of this algae, and that is what causes coral bleaching. So not only will they not get the energy from this algae, they won't get the colour, so they turn pretty much white. <laughs> Thanks for that, Pat. So yeah, we're heading towards the end of the day, because my ear is going down. So we're going to just be on top of the pinnacle now instead of going around it. And any questions that you have, make sure you send them in before we wrap up the day. We can see that there's a heap of Gorgonians here as well. So Gorgonians are corals, but they are not the true stony corals. So they're not the ones that are providing the structure to this reef. So the Gorgonians are the ones that sit on top and like this one we're seeing right now, just gently sways in the current. Yeah, I think Emil is actually trying to show you the macro that's swimming in the background. It's quite a big one, but I think it's swam off. It was a cero, part of the macro family. But it swam off, so now we're just having a look at this big, beautiful Gorgonian, as Pat was saying, and I can barely keep up with this current. <laughs> if you can see it moving, it's been really pushed over, and that's how powerful this current actually is. And we can see that it's bending a certain way. It's bending in, uh, into the current on the, on, I suppose you could say the front side of it. And that is because they can actually rotate on their axial skeleton, so a rod skeleton that runs through them. They can actually rotate so that they're facing into the current. Now this does two things. It increases the surface area uh, available to the current so they can filter out more food and it also stops them from breaking so if they were to be pushed side on then they could snap a lot easier so you'll notice if there's a lot of gorgonians all in the one space that they will all generally be facing the same direction and that is the direction of the current okay well thank you everybody this has been a great new experience for us Despite the strong current, it's just been awesome to explore somewhere new and share it with you. So we will be back at 11am and it also will be somewhere new, but we'll keep that a surprise for now. So thank you, Dive Life family. Thank you, Emil. And thank you, Pat. We'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody. I look forward to our second boat dive, 11am, Grand Cayman time. I'll see you under the water.